Hi, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Data's Love. I'm super excited. Yeah, I know. We have all of the, the, the hand movements. Really excited to have you on, Holly. Um, famous philanthropist, <laughs> um, Forbes, 50 over a, 50. an age. That ladies of a certain 50. age. Ladies of a certain things. age. Um, right? Um, saying things, taking names, all the things. No holds barred, man. Right? You only have so long to live. Um, so will you just tell folks a little bit about yourself? And I, like, I want to know, like, how, how, like, what is this path to, like, being a famous person in <laughs> philanthropy? Aparna, you're hilarious. First of all, it's so nice to see you and I miss you. Um, and it's, you're famous. You're the one who's hosting these LinkedIn lives. Um, so I got into this, how many of us in this sector, like, intended to get into philanthropy? Like, zero unless you not know, me 100 not me right not you and we our lives take circuitous routes and i think for me i was an executive director well i was an organizer i was organizing pro-choice marches in the midwest during a couple of summers of really bad uh, legislative actions in the states in the 90s that was kind of my first job out of college and um, that led to um, working in domestic violence and I was an executive director and then I was on the board of the New York Women's Foundation, which was my philanthropy college. And that's mm -hmm. where I really learned firsthand what a group of women in this case could accomplish sitting around kitchen tables. And it was sort of my like the kitchen tables are the locus of a lot of powerful organizing. And that was the first time I saw and experienced these groups of women raising literal hundreds of thousands of dollars over a meal. And here I was as an executive director of a scrappy little organization in the Korean American community, like begging for a thousand dollars. And these women were raising hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I was like, oh my God, like what is happening over there? I need to learn about that. Um, and then the last thing I'll share is that I was part of a get um, and a get is a Korean shared savings circle. And this idea exists in every culture and community. I would like to know what it is in where you grew up, Aparna, and in your family. I know you grew up in a couple of different countries overseas. Yeah. And in Korea, get's work by just like friends come together and put their money into a pot, often over a meal or over at someone's house. And um, the people who are part of that circle at that time take, take turns taking that pot home. And I started the Asian Women Giving Circle by turning that idea into a philanthropic one. Um, and giving circles are totally taking off. But the idea here is that all of us come from cultures where this is practiced. Um, my Mexican friends call them tandas. My West uh, African country friends call them susus. There's some Caribbean countries that call them isusus. My Ethiopian friend calls them ahi bears. My Indonesian girlfriend calls them arisons, you know. Um, so I would say that all of these exist in all of our backgrounds. And the trick in a way is like, how do we turn those things into philanthropic practice in America today? Ooh. How do we turn them into philanthropic practice in America today? Okay, so you founded, co-founded a pretty significant, I would say, organization called Donors of Color Network. And, uh, you know, um, in all of the times that I've been in philanthropy, but I think just like really in the last couple of years, it's been really grating on me that there's like of color, which implies, right? It implies that there is a normal. Yeah. Right, like there is, there is like the mainstream, and they they're white, right? Like regular donors are white, and then there are donors of color, and that I think perpetuates this idea that people of color don't have wealth because we're not donors, right? Like, um, and I'm I'm curious, like in the research that you have been doing, in but right, like in setting up this organization. What is the data around wealth in communities of color? There's actually not a ton. And I want to just say right off the bat that the Donors of Color Network was founded by three people. Um, Urvashi Vad, who is organizing Angels in Heaven right now. You know, she died mm -hmm. too soon a few months ago. And she's kind of the mom of this project in a way. And the other co-founder is Ashindi Maxson, who's a brilliant strategist and 
cool cat. <laughs> and then I, yeah. got to, I got to be very lucky to be part of the beginnings of this thing. And um, the part of the research that I got to lead was this qualitative piece, which was interviewing actual real life mm -hmm. people in 10 cities across the country. So I got to interview 113 wealthy folks of color in 10 cities. And I did all the interviews except for like five. Um, it was so much fun, Aparna. Uh, but to answer your question, um, the first part of the research was a landscape analysis. And um, Irvishi thought of a brilliant title for the, that paper, which is the apparitional donor. And apparitional means ghostly. And the, the story there is that each of us was doing a lot of just talking and speaking at various conferences, including those conferences that bring together wealthy folks to do stuff in the world. And we noticed that there were very few donors of color in those audiences, especially in the networks that brought together wealthy people. But all three of us knew wealthy people of color, but they were not being involved um, in those networks because there was something honestly inhospitable about those networks for the donors of color who we knew. So there was a little bit of like, huh, like where are, why aren't we there? Like a little bit of anger, a little bit of like, come on, like we know we're there. So we set out to do this research and um, we hired a, a political um, data modeling company called Target Smart with this question, mm -hmm. how many millionaire households in America are headed by a person of color? And it was actually a very difficult question to answer because you know data and a lot of organizations do not even ask, you know, what yeah. is the race, ethnicity, what's the background of the people on their donor role? So if you don't even have that base knowledge of data, how do you even have answer the question? If you're the head of an mm -hmm. organization, much less trying to um, gather data from across the sector. Um, yeah. So, and Target Smart came back to us and said about one in eight millionaire households in America are headed by a person mm -hmm. of color. And it's the racial wealth gap is real. When you do a bar yeah. chart of millionaire households in America, the white led households are like the bar chart goes really far. Like imagine Vanna White walking across the stage. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Well, um, folks of you know various ethnicity groups of color are much smaller bar charts. But if you add up the bar charts of folks of color, um, it's about one in eight. And it's a it's a real conservative estimate because in this mm -hmm. data modeling, there was a large um, other category, which we think encapsulates mixed race households or groups that didn't report. So we just reported the one in eight, which is a conservative figure. And mm -hmm. I you know that old expression, like, don't assume, because if you assume it makes an ass out of you and me, I think the story of philanthropy in the United States has not been fully told, right? Because it's historically been told as a white story, a white male story, and as you know, often a dead white male story. <laughs> and in recent years, it's the story of philanthropy has been told as a billionaire story. So with this body of work, we really wanted to um, just change the narrative. Like there are people of color who are extremely jealous. Some of them are very, very rich. Um, yeah, I can share a little bit about the demographics of the people that we interviewed because we ourselves were surprised. You know, we had our own internal biases um, about the wealth of the folks that we interviewed, um, and you know, we tried to put that front and center in the in our report, like our own biases as the primary investigators. Should I share some um, demographics real quick? I absolutely. I want to hear about the demographics, but I also want to hear like from you in these different categories of wealth, right? Because you just said that the current story of philanthropy is very much focused on billionaires, what they are or are not giving, right? And it's rarely like relative to the wealth that they have. And so, you know, living in Seattle, I'll often, you know, kind of smirk or roll my eyes at Amazon giving $10 million to address homelessness. And I'm like, what is $10 million if you have $200 billion, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's like me buying you a latte and not really thinking about the five, six, seven dollars that I spent on it, right? Yeah. Effectively. Um, but there are lots of terms that I think it's get bounced around like H and I's mass app, you know, so what, like, how do you define wealth to begin with, right? Because there's a lot of wealthy people that are not specifically billionaires. 
Yeah, um, for our, there isn't a standard definition, as you know, but there just isn't. So we pulled banking data and philanthropic data to come up with our working definitions for this paper. <laughs> so yeah. just like that's the, def that's our small world, right? So our working de definitions of high net worth are those folks who have the ability to give away $50,000 per year or more, which roughly translates to 1 million liquid net investable. And it's a, it's kind of lame, but you know, when you're a foundation, you have to give away 5% by, you know, by law. Yeah. So 50,000 is 5% of 1 million. So that's kind of how it. we derive that. And then our definition of ultra high net worth is the ability to give away $1 million per year or more. And that roughly translates to liquid net investable assets of 30 million or more. And by liquid net, investable assets, I mean, if you subtract the value of your primary home, right, because for lots yeah. of us, our home is our primary asset, or, you know, mm -hmm. a giant primary asset. So if you take away that from your net worth, the other stuff is roughly your liquid net investable. And one of the yeah. things that surprised us, because we had our own biases, like I just mentioned, is that almost a quarter, 22% of our sample of 113 wealthy folks of color, 22% of them reported liquid net investable assets well north of $30 million. So we actually revised, um, when we were doing these interviews, we had this little checkbox thing that we asked people to fill out at the end. We revised yeah. our uh, net worth portion of it upwards because yeah. quickly we were finding, oh, holy shit, like these folks are wealthier than we even assumed. So that was a, a bias um, on our team. Yeah, and I think that like relative to like most people where, you know, like often financial advisors will say you need $2 million to retire, right? Not a million to give away. Like in the whole of your retirement, you're going to need roughly one and a half to $2 million. And so this is a pretty significant amount of money, even though it's nowhere close to being a billionaire. Right. And there were, um, I think we interviewed a handful of billionaires in our um, research. And we made an intentional choice, and I think it was the right one, to interview non-famous people. You know, like we wanted mm. to find the millionaire next door whose name you don't know. There are maybe two people in our sample whose name you might know, but you're kind of an insider, you know? Yeah. Um, now, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like if LeBron had called me and said, I want to be part of your study, I would have taken the next flight to interview LeBron. I would have loved to interview him. And I would have, I would mm -hmm. love to interview some wealthy folks of color who are famous. But for this, yeah. for this project, um, we set out to interview people who aren't, are unfamous. And I think that was the right call because when we think about our sector and moving dollars and the wealth gap that exists in our country, racial or otherwise, um, yeah. we care about moving dollars towards equity and justice, my team. And um, so we wanted to find those folks who have the wealth. And some of those dollars, as you just alluded to, are just kind of sitting in donor advice funds and not really moving to address the many things that need to be addressed in our community and world right now. Okay, so I want to talk about donor advice funds, because I don't know that folks watching know what they are. Will you just tell us quickly, what was the like racial ethnic breakdown of the people that you interviewed? The largest self, one of our first questions is like, Aparna, if I'm interviewing you, right? I would say, yeah. um, Aparna, in your own words, tell me about your race, ethnicity and other identities. Yeah. And as you can imagine, that response can sometimes take an hour. <laughs> so uh, some of these conversations, most of them were not, we, we asked for 90 minutes since they, most of them took about that long, but some of them went on yeah. for like four hours. Um, so in terms of self-reported ethnicities, the highest yeah. groups were um, Black and African American and South Asian, um, followed by East Asian, Latinx, um, and then we also include Muslim American, which isn't an ethnicity. It's not an ethnicity, but it's a religious um, mm -hmm. minority in America. And after 9-11, we thought we kind of wanted to pull that group out as well. And then we also asked folks, we also tried to find some folks who were indigenous in our sample. That, did that surprise you? How hard it was to find indigenous folks or what? To the fact Well, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I imagine that it was probably hard to find indigenous folks, but that you just said that the highest percentage in your sample size are black 
and South Asian. The South Asian bit doesn't surprise me because I imagine that that's first gen tech wealth, you know, or STEM related wealth. But like your study had a lot of black folks. It did. And, you know, our team, right? So Ishidi's black, Irvish yeah. is South Asian, I'm Korean American. So our team, we had natural, and we all of us, all three of us had pretty close and uh, long lasting sort of collegial and work relationships with women's mm -hmm. funds. So for yeah. example, 68% of our sample are women of color with wealth. That does not mean that 68% of the wealthy people in America are women. It does not mean that it just means that this is who we could get. Like these are the people yeah. who said yes to the three of us who are leading this project. So it wasn't a surprise to us that like, I don't know, 30 interviews in, we realized like our, our population, our respondents who were reporting Hispanic, Lat Latina, Latino, Latinx backgrounds was really skinny. So we literally stopped the, pro I stopped the project and said, okay, we have to stop, reassess. Um, I doubled my outreach to my friends at the Latino Community Foundation. And we added Phoenix as a city, went back to Dallas. Um, mm -hmm. And by the end, we had a higher than nationally representative sample of Latinx folks um, as respondents. It was hard to find indigenous um, individuals who would inter who would speak to me. You know, they are out there. A lot of wealth is held by tribes um, through casino, um, you know, gambling um, and yeah. also natural resources on land held by um, native tribes, indigenous tribes. But there are individuals um, who are wealthy in those communities. But because I think it's because we didn't really have a teammate who was a representative of um, indigenous communities, we just had a harder time getting people to say yes. And philanthropy has been like pretty, has done really bad stuff in Indian country, you know? So even, yeah. I mean, you know, it's all, it's, it's just evident. So we were not surprised yeah. that this ph philanthropic based project was having a hard time finding friends um, amongst our indigenous friends. Yeah, well, I think philanthropy has done really bad stuff, period, right? Yeah. And continues to, continues to be pretty exploitative. And I, that, I mean, I feel like that's a whole other conversation, just the morality around, like, should this sector even exist? And if yeah. it should, in what form? Totally. Um, <clears throat> what is the source of wealth in BIPOC communities in America? Again, I'm going to clarify that it's what I'm sharing is just from our sample. So just yeah. based on the 130, I've interviewed 150, upwards of 150 people, but in this paper, it's 113, right? So yeah. um, the 80% of our sample are wealth earners themselves. You know, they themselves have leapfrogged multiple rungs on the socioeconomic ladder. Roughly yeah. about 10% of our sample um, are inheritors. So they're second and in a couple of cases, third generation um, inheritors of wealth and about 10%, it's like eight or nine and 11 or 12, but close to 10% on, on each of these last two categories are folks who report marriage as their yeah. primary source of wealth. And the asterisk there is that many of those folks also earned a lot more money than the families in which they grew up, but that in addition to that, they also married people who bumped up their um, socioeconomic class, I guess, um, even more than their own wealth status. So 80% are wealth earners, wealth creators themselves. And that means, Aparna, that these folks are part of multi-class, mixed-class families and yeah. mixed-class communities, which raises a whole host of humorous incidences, not humorous incidences, tensions, um, you know, just lots of stories there about like, I remember this one guy said how crazy it was for him the first time his dad asked him to borrow some money, you know, like that was just so against the way he'd been raised. And it was just like this moment, he was like, God, this is hard. And, and another person shared that in his community, like his success, a lot of people like aunties, uncles, cousins, neighbors, not all blood related, right? As we know, yeah. <laughs> feel like they had a part in this kid's success, you know? So when yeah. you know, decades later, they're still part of these communities and families and neighborhoods, it's really hard to say no, you know, when people have 
um, things that they want you to help out with them with or things they want you to invest in. This one woman we interviewed who's a, a financial planner. She used to work for a big bank and now she's a wealth advisor and planner. She, she advises her clients of color not to be your family's ATM machine, right? But at the same time, she totally acknowledges how hard it is not to, you know? I have no ability to say, like, to to say no. None, nada, zero. Yeah. Can't can't do it. Struggle with it. Like, it, it just doesn't even matter. It's, um, and I, and I think that, you know, if you're like first gen, upwardly mobile, maybe wealthy, but maybe not wealthy, um, there's a lot of guilt. There's tons of guilt. There's also so much guilt, so much guilt. And also like actual real life dollars that go out the door, you know, like these yeah. are folks who are paying for their parents' mortgages and buying homes mm -hmm. for their siblings and their cousins. I mean, in one very moving story, this couple who are black, they're gay. They spent about 50 to 70,000 a year on the previous year that, that when I interviewed them um, on charitable political giving, just like the normal stuff that would be on your, you know, plan or whatever. But that same year, they spent $500,000 in support of their family and friends, like literally 10 times. The range um, in family support, almost everyone in our sample in this report gives a lot yeah. of money to their family and friends. And it ranged from, you know, a few thousand dollars a year, like I take everyone on a vacation, to one woman who spends $1.2 million a year on her family <laughs> in India. Yeah, I believe that. I yeah. mean, I absolutely believe that. Um, okay, I, I I have so many questions. I know I you know. said you would like park so the idea of the DAF for a second as well. Um, there's definitely this like how money goes out the door for people uh, for people with wealth, um, which is very different. But before we go there, I want to ask you, 80% of the people in your sample are likely representative of what's actually happening in the country at a broader scale is ish. Ish, maybe. <laughs> that this data is very hard to find, right? Like, yeah. even the Forbes billionaire list is a, an entirely speculative list. Yeah. Nobody knows how much money Donald Trump has, for instance, like right. zero people other than his accountant um and maybe his kids um so relative to that 80 percent, what how do white people hold their wealth like is it majority owned is it majority inherited i have no idea i mean i really i mean i can I, we did look at some data like WealthX does this survey yeah. of very, very wealthy American or people around the globe, but their, mm -hmm. their, their um, criteria are so different. Like their wealthy people are so extremely wealthy, <laughs> like yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars. Like they just are off the charts wealthy as compared to the people that we interviewed, right? Like all yeah. folks are just like, they're not as wealthy as that. So, and in fact, there's a footnote in here, I can't find it, where we kind of poke fun at it a little bit because they don't count, like a lot of the people who they report as super, super, super wealthy started out with like 50 million or more in inherited wealth. So yeah. even though they might report those people as earners because they earned money on top of that thing that they started with, that's just like not the same <laughs> as what we're talking about here. I mean, it'd be interesting to do another study, you know, at some point on the ultra, ultra high net worth donors of color out there, um, and ours was confined to US, right? Like ours was a domestic study. Um, but mm -hmm. the, the people we interviewed grew up working class, poor, middle class in some cases, and in some cases, really, really, really poor. Like they told us about digging through trash and their countries of origin to find stuff to sell. And one man spoke about how per during periods of his life, his family of seven um, lived in and out of their station wagon, you know? And now these are folks who are giving away hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know? And at the same mm -hmm. time, I'm one person who has one of these kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, kind of rags to which a story, he made a point of saying, uh, bootstraps is bullshit. I'm sorry to say another bad word on LinkedIn Live, but bootstraps is baloney, right? Because he, yeah. um, at all, pretty much like the people that we, and it was probably some of the questions we asked because we always asked about like legacy and tell us about the family stories that get passed on in your family, yeah. matriarchs and the, and the patriarchs in your family. Um, they talked about their 
their grandmas and their aunties and the their coach or someone at church or the adult who was kind to them, who was a you know a relative or not. Uh, lots of aunties, which is that thing we were talking about before we went live, like the role of aunties in in people's lives, like people who were who saw one man who said to me, you know, like all my aunties were able to see the aunties are able to see the king in the boy and the boy in the king. And my mm. aunties were able to see both in me, you know, and my God, like when he said that to me, we're both crying. There was a lot of crying and laughing in these interviews, Aparna. I mean, that's just such the most beautiful image, you know, and this is man, a man in his early fifties. He's recalling someone who was important to him in his middle school years, you know, and this auntie who's not a blood relative planted the idea in this man's head that he might go to college and expand the good brain that God gave him and planted the idea that this man might go on to have an, a more expansive life than this kid was able yeah. to imagine for himself. Right. So it's almost like these aunties helped this kid, you know, and times a hundred in, in the interviews that we did, imagine a future for themselves that was different than the one that was staring them right in the face, you know? Yeah, I, I read the report, of course, as like any good nerd would. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think like some of those things really, really stood out to me as well is like, yeah, bootstrapping is bullshit. I, I think that for a lot of people, you know, we find the one person or people along the way that just grab us and yank us forward, right? Like the people that are like, of course you can be better. Like, and let me show you how. Of course you can apply for this amazing, bigger, better job. And let, like, let me literally show you how. Um, and that is often the difference that's often the difference totally. between staying where you are and going farther. Okay, earlier you referenced WealthX, which collects a lot of data on high net worth, ultra high net worth uh, individuals. And, you know, a couple of years ago, one of the things that surprised me, and, you know, this is also like my own bias, having spent the first decade of my career in nonprofits and in education, is that the vast majority of philanthropic dollars go to the three A's, right? This is like the WealthX report. The marketing person came up with them. Um, animals, <laughs> arts, and the alma maters, right? Animals, arts, alma maters. And it's always, always stuck with me yeah. that rich people would rather give money to saving some like hairless dog variety in Antarctica than they would give money to low-income communities and communities of color, which are not mutually exclusive. Yeah. Um, and so I'm curious, like, where are donors of colors prioritizing their giving outside of family, which is not necessarily under the umbrella of what philanthropy con considers charitable giving? Yeah. What are they prioritizing? Well, we asked. I'm so glad you asked. And it's on page 32 of the full report in a bar chart, if you mm -hmm. want it. And all of these are available <clears throat> for free download. And I think we're going to share them on LinkedIn later. You can get them on Radiant's website. Um, so we asked. And the we used the typical categories that, you know, the, the goofy sector that we're in uses, including agriculture, you know, like no one picked that. Um, so yeah. number one, and again, this is not representative of anything except for it describes the 113 people in this paper. So number one yeah. was education, which is the alma mm -hmm. mater, lots of Harvard, Yale, Stanford, MITs in our report, like an alarming amount. And that maps to the, what you just said, like the general surveys of philanthropy and wealthy communities, like number, education is almost always number one. Number two yeah in our sample, which you will find in no sample of regular donors, white donors. Number two was social justice as the number one priority. Number three mm -hmm. was women and gender rights. Number four was racial justice. Number five was health. Number six was income inequality. So four out of the top six are dramatically different than what you will find in other surveys of wealthy donors in general, which in our country typically means wealthy white donors. Right, social yeah. justice, number two, women and gender, number three, uh, racial justice, number four. 
and income inequality number six. That's amazing. It is amazing. I mean, it's like, yeah, and there was a study, um, PRE did a study, right? Like post George Floyd and then post post George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And they found, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but donors of color were prioritizing um, economic, race, social, gender justice higher um, than surveys of donors in, in general in the PRE report, which I can find and share with you guys later. Yeah. Um, okay, so I imagine um, that these priorities are meant to like right the ship, right? Like they're meant to close the very many inequities that exist around the world, but I think specifically, it's kind of cruel and unusual in America. Um, and, and, and I'm also hearing that there is kind of a nod to organizers and there is nod to people closer, like to the ground, to doing this work that are proximate with other communities of color and like other impacted low-income communities. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit as we like start to wrap up to like what you're working on now. <laughs> this is this version one. Is this V zero? Yes. This beta situation. It's exactly. like very thick. We are um, ripping apart. Many trees were felled for the production of I this um, beautiful document. Will you tell tell us about how you're taking everything that you know about like? organizing and donors of color and changing how philanthropy happens. Yeah. And I want to connect this to data because your show is called Data is Love and That's your right. company yeah. Moving Beyond is all about data. And I would say That's like right. I've been involved in two big research projects of late and I'm super lucky and I love it. So we take a, we do a bunch of research and then we apply it right away in the world. And then we figure out like, where did we screw up? What can we make better? And we tweak it and do it again. People call it iterating, but it's really just like doing it, figuring out what you stood wrong and how you can do it better yeah. and doing it. So for this one, like philanthropy always sounds like someone else. The subject was very clear, like donors of color, where are we? We know we're, we know we're there. Let's go find them. Let's go research them and let's go interview them and let's go find out yeah. what moves them and where they move their money and what, what they want to do in the world with philanthropy mm -hmm. as a fever. With the Freedom School for Philanthropy, the problem was very different. Like typically in our sector, philanthropy, um, the subject is the donor. But for this mm -hmm. curriculum, we flipped it. And in fact, that's the thesis of Radiant Strategies that I'm building with my dear budding colleague, Latarek Amara. Um, the, 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 the thesis here is that the subject of the philanthropic story is not the donor, They've been the mm -hmm. subject, but the subject ought to be the thing in the world that we're trying to fix. <laughs> and it ought to be the communities that we're out there in the world working on. So the very first step that we, not working on, but working with, like to better the conditions yeah. for more people in America, that's the subject. The subject is not the wealthy white dude who's giving away a lot of money. So for this project, the very first thing we did was we interviewed mm -hmm. movement leaders. You know, we, we asked yeah. 20 different or almost 20 movement leaders, hey, like think about the individual donors that you've been in relationship with. Tell us about some good ones and what are the attributes of that relationship and how can we build more of those types of individual donors. And we're focusing on individuals for this because of the wealth gap in America. There's so much wealth held at the very top of that food chain that if we want to move dollars quickly, like a lot of dollars quickly, we've got to talk about those, talk with, move, organize those folks. Um, and then secondly, we also interviewed some donors, many of whom were kind of nominated by the movement people we interviewed, who these are individual donors who are well on their kind of equity learning journeys and they are looking at the sources of their wealth and how they want to redistribute it and how they can go some ways towards repairing some of the relationships yeah. and um, communities in which they're involved. And we interviewed them too. So based on the guidance and wishes of primarily the movement folks, and then we added um, some donor interviews as well, we built we built this thing and um, we're deep into iterating it and I'm really proud of it. But I think that one of the things for when we talk about data is like, what's the guiding question, you know, like what's yeah. the subject of the inquiry. And if we just yeah. assume that the subject is always going to be donors and philanthropy, then we're always going to get it wrong because that is actually not the subject. 
um, and you know, kind of like what I said early on, like when we started the Donors of Color Project um, research, people weren't even asking, you know, like how many donors of color are there in your organization, you XYZ progressive social justice building organization. And a lot mm -hmm. of people didn't know. Um, and the analogy I can make there, Aparna, is like, you know, like a lot of people during COVID, I've gained some weight and I'd like to lose it. <laughs> And if I want to actually do that project, which yeah. you know, I'm on the fence to be, let's be honest, um, I will have to get on a scale and figure out, okay, what's the number here? And if I want to lose mm -hmm. that 10, 20 pounds, I kind of got to know what my baseline is. And for this um, race and equity conversations within organizations, it's such a simple thing, but like, what's the baseline? Like, what are we starting with? It's got to be, it's got to be part of the beginning inquiry, right? And then I would put out there this idea of like, what's the subject of your inquiry as you're embarking on a data or a research project? And the aha moment for us at the beginning of this Freedom School for Philanthropy Build, our aha moment was, you know what? It's not the donor, it's actually the movement, yeah. so the hero of the story. Mm, I love that. It's the movements that are the hero of the story. I just want to show folks a couple of the pages from this really beautifully designed <laughs> book, right? There, it's, what I love is that it really is a journey, right? Like, so you have these thematic um, sections, so soul accountability, right? With this beautiful quote from James Baldwin. Um, and then exactly, right, the guiding questions. And then there, this one, the accountability one is that, how do we ensure the power of our philanthropy is kept true to our values, goals, and communities, right? And not being a marketing stunt, which I think, I think you're right. And you've brought it up many times. The story is so much about the, the wealthy person. And I almost feel like there is this culture of like bragging um, around like who's funding who, right? So it's like, wow, like, you know, I got a grant from Lauren Paul Jobs or McKinsey Scott or Melinda Gates or, you know, like who's funding me? Um, and like there's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like braggy but bizarre because they are the ones that should actually be really grateful that you have the power to change the world in the ways in which totally. you do. There's right. a story um, in the transformation chapter of this workbook. There, have you heard about the indigenous aunties in British Columbia? There's a land back initiative. And if you yes. want, if Aparna Ray wins the lottery <clears throat> and Aparna wants to donate a million dollars to this land back initiative by an indigenous community on the West coast of Canada, um, what's now Canada, then Aparna Ray would have to go in front of a council of indigenous aunties and seek their permission to join the community as a funder and a donor. So there's yeah. an example of flipping the script of who, who has the say, you know, mm -hmm. and not all of us can do that, you know, but I just think it's such a good, it's a good thing to think about because where are the other yeah. places in our practice where we can flip the script and more center the thing that ought to be centered rather than the person who oftentimes just inherited a bunch of money. I mean, we just finished piloting this curriculum, Aparna, with a group of real life donors um, at, at Fidelity, which is the largest DAF a donor advice fund sponsor in the world, which makes them, yeah. in a, you know, by default, the largest grant maker in the world. And this very wonderful uh, man who was part of the cohort, he said, about three quarters of the way through, you know, it's kind of a re relief not to be the hero of the story. Like it's kind of, I mm. like not having to be the, the protagonist. Like I'm speaking as him, right? This man said, I like not being the protagonist. I, I really appreciate being in a more supporting role, you know, like just using a theater kind of metaphor because he said he doesn't feel equipped. He doesn't know as much as the people on the ground working on the issues that he cares about. Um, he knows that about himself. So he's always felt a little bit fraudulent. You know, he was handed this role because of the way philanthropy is set up in America and the family, his family has money, et cetera. He, he was handed this role that never really, he never felt fully comfortable in it. So actually it was a relief to him to know that there were other ways to be in mm. relationship as a donor with movement. Mm. Ah, cool, huh? If only we could, yeah, I mean, like, if only we could, we could get the, the vast majority of philanthropists or wannabe philanthropists to acknowledge that, yeah, you, you, you play a supporting role. Um, and sometimes you have to get out of the way, 
yeah. rather than impose rules and restrictions that actually make it really hard to do to do the work of social and change. There's places like Vanessa, da- we interviewed Vanessa Daniel, who was the out- founder and um, but now has just left Groundswell. Uh, and she, yeah. she described like a, 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 a one individual donor with whom she's in relationship who played a role of like left flank, you know, like she was in a political situation. She needed some cover. She needed some people to take the heat for her yeah. and, and the movements that, you know, organizations that grants full funds. And she was like, that's an incredibly important role that an individual wealthy donor could play or opening doors for um, her, like politically mm-hmm. um, to people that she needs to speak with um, who are moving legislation um, that impacts the issues she cares about. You know, like there's lots of important roles to play that are occasionally kind of center stage, right? But mm-hmm. the, the point, it's like at, at the instruction or with the guidance or arm in arm with um, the folks on the ground who are doing actually the harder work and actually the riskier work, right? Yeah. Oh, I feel like we can just stay for another three hours and keep talking <laughs> about movements and Freedom School and how we really change this ecosystem. Um, but I don't think that we have that today. Um, I know, I know it's the worst. I think it's, you know, we try and do this in 30 minutes. Oh, we're over. I'm so sorry. Yeah, we're definitely, I mean, we are over and, and I feel like there are people watching that are like, and what else, what else do you have? What little nuggets can I get from this conversation this morning? Um, Okay. So we're going to start wrapping up. Tell us how we can support your work um like what are you building and putting out that we should get behind um spread the word about this we're super excited isis kraus latara kamara ayushi vig and i are the little tiny team that's building this thing we want to pilot it with advisors like people who are like gatekeepers for folks with money and also with wealthy donors and families. I'm writing a yeah. book called The Big We about how we collectively are so much stronger than the sum of our individual parts and that the work is so much more fun and meaningful and impactful and durable if we do it together. Um, and then I don't know, just let's just keep the conversation going on LinkedIn or otherwise stay in touch. It takes it takes all of us to do the things that need to be done out there. Let's do it with some joy and love and in friendship with food and beverage of your choice, because that's what we got to do to build our world better, right? Like our the democracy that we yearn for, the pluralistic, multi, multiracial democracy that I know I yearn for. Um, it's going to take all of us. It sure will. Holly, thank you so much for your wisdom and your time and uh, um folks can uh connect with you on linkedin yes um i'm pretty and easy to get a you're pretty easy to get a hold of um or like check out radiant strategies that's your new shop um woman of color owned and operated totally um, always right always. always um um all right folks thank you so much for thank joining you us this morning. so much have fun. a great day everybody